Netcasts you love. From people you trust. This is Twit. Bandwidth for Know How is brought to you by Cashfly at C A C H E F L Y dot com. This episode of Know How is brought to you by iFixit. You can fix it, and iFixit makes it easy. With free step by step repair guides, high quality replacement parts, and all the tools you'll ever need. For $10 off your purchase of $50 or more, go to ifixit.com slash twit and enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout. And buy the Ring Video Doorbell. With Ring, you can see and talk to anyone at your door from anywhere in the world using your smartphone. It's like caller ID for your home. Get $25 off the Ring Video Doorbell when you go to ring.com slash knowhow. Today on Know How, we have Megabots. We're finishing up Project Know How 250. Your questions are answers. And I'm the one who knocks. It's the Twitch show where we build, Ben, break, and cook. Uh, did we start doing that we, now? I don't know. <laughs> uh, I'm Father Robert Pallas here. And I'm Brian Burnett. And for the next hour or so, we're going to take you through some of the projects that we've been working on so you can take them home and geek out on your own. Uh, Brian, this has been a crazy, crazy week if you're an anime enthusiast. Uh, yeah, not just anime enthusiast. I mean, uh, any fan of giant mechanized robots, it's been good news. I'm big fans of mechanized robots. Now, we, we actually did have a spot of news that we missed out on. Remember we went to Maker Fair not too long ago? Yes, yeah, it was a lot of fun. And we couldn't go to the first day because, well, it was uh, the new screensavers and we both kind of <laughs> had stuff to do. Yeah, that was kind of a crazy weekend, a weekend. for us. It was a yeah. weekend. But if we had made it out there, we would have seen an actual megabot. It, so what's a megabot? A uh, megabot se? is twelve tons of geeky awesomeness. <laughs> uh, it was created by uh, two men by the name of what is it? Matt Orlean and Guy Caval Cavalcanti. Cavalcanti. Sure, Cavalcanti. Their, sure. their names will become synonymous with robot combat in the future. I I, I know this. Uh, <laughs> they had a dream, the and they they tried to they tried combat. to kickstart this dream, mm -hmm. right? And they wanted to create an actual like mech, like mech right. warrior like, Robotech. That's exactly what I thought of when I first saw it, too. And that's pretty much exactly what they created. <laughs> uh, it's, uh, it's, it is, well, it, it didn't quite make it all the way on Kickstarter, mm -hmm. but then, uh, what was it, Autodesk, Autodesk stepped in. Yeah. And they said, hey, if you'll, if you'll design this with our software, we'll, uh, we'll, we'll pay the rest of the bill. And by design this, they meant a uh, giant robot with guns attached to it. Absolutely. Very American. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, we've got some video of this running, and I'm sure Alex is going to throw it in here. They, that first prototype was at Maker Faire, and it made a lot of news that first day because basically they were using it to, they had these cannons that were shooting paintball Grenades. They, yeah, they're not like your typical paintball. These look like baseballs or softball yeah, size. Yeah, no, no, these are huge. These, I mean, uh, they were blowing out windows, and uh, yeah. they turned the the air pressure way, way down because they didn't want to actually go through cars and <laughs> go through a car that, with that, a paintball. That would yeah, be, yeah, that would be a bad, bad thing. Uh, yeah, of course, what is what good is an ass whooping robot if it doesn't <laughs> have something to whoop? So what these guys did, they did this. They, they did something fantastic. A while back. A Japanese team led by uh, uh, a man by the name of uh, Ko Kogoro Kurata. He created like a Gundam mech. It was kind of elegant. I mean, yeah. as much as this is an American bot, so this is steel, it's yeah. big, it's heavy, it will crush you. They created something a bit more elegant. And, uh, <laughs> the and Alex, samurai if you sword. go ahead and show the call out video, they, uh, they, they did call out to the Japanese team and they said, hey, you know what? We challenge you to war. <laughs> <laughs> is this the call-out video? <laughs> this this is the call-out video. So, wow. Yeah. So these are they're they're walking around in their maker space, uh, and they're talking about their uh, their robot, the Megabot. It's powered by a 24 horsepower gas engine. It drives a 2,500 psi hydraulic system. So that's what gives it its movement. Its own. Uh -huh. It's got 20 actuators. 13 joints, it rides on two sets of treads, really it can hunker down to 11 and a half feet, but then it rises to 15 feet, Big. and it fires three pound paintball paintballs at 100 miles an hour. 
<laughs> Jeez. Yeah, this thing took 100 days of construction, 35 people, cost about $175,000. And as you can tell, it's pretty, pretty <laughs> badass. God bless America. <laughs> Oh, okay, so this is typical American hubris, and, and they needed someone to say, uh, we want to challenge you, because what they envision is like a robot league. They want to see robots playing paintball. Uh, so, BattleBots to, like, it'll make BattleBots look like robots for ants. Right, see, but this, see, this is the Karatis. This is the, the Japanese robot, and as you can tell, it's far more elegant, right? Uh, it does look a, a lot more technical. Yeah. Yeah. But it's a single <laughs> pilot versus two pilots, uh, and it's actually... Wait, who has the two pilots? The American the one? The American or? has two pilots. Huh. Uh, and the Karatis, so while the Megabot Mark II, that they built a new one, is mm -hmm. 15 feet, 12 tons, and uses tracks, the Karatis is 12 feet, 9 tons, and it uses wheels. Uh, okay, so it's probably more agile is its big uh, advantage. It's, it's more agile, it's, it's a bit faster, yeah. and, and um, I'm pretty sure that Karatis looked at the Megabot and he said, oh, of course. In fact, uh, go ahead and play his video. He, he, he did a call-out of the call-out. He said, oh, typical Americans. Yeah, you just, make something and you want to stick guns on it. <laughs> uh, yeah, I think that's pretty accurate. Yeah. This is so much fun, though, because now it's like a little bit of a back and forth thing. And uh, he says, hey, you know what? Uh, I accept your challenge. <laughs> That now, is awesome. Remember, they tried to sell the Karatas for like a million. You could actually buy your own. It was like a million and some if you wanted to pick up one of the robots. Uh, but yeah, he's saying, oh, hey guys, come on, make it cooler than that. Just yeah. building something huge and sticking guns on it. Super American. <laughs> exactly. So he has another idea. He says, I will accept your challenge, but um, I don't want to use guns. I he want it to, to go melee combat. Yeah, so he's probably going to strap a giant samurai sword to it, right? <laughs> well, I, I mean, if you look at the design, I think the Karatis would definitely have the, the advantage, advantage there. Melee. Yeah. It's far more mobile. Um, but uh, one of the other things he, he says, which is, look, this is we're basically building machines <laughs> off of anime. Yeah. Jap Japan is anime. We have to own this. Yeah. Well, you can see where they have probably gotten inspiration from each other. Like, Japan is definitely on it's the, like, Gundam, Gundam style. style. And then the American like is, like, Warrior. Mech Warrior yeah, style. Just plotting tank. Bah, bah. Yeah, yeah. That, that, this yeah, is exactly. exactly what I thought of when I first saw it. I was like, this is Mech Warrior. It totally <laughs> looks like that. It really does. I would love to ride around in a Timberwolf. Oh, it's funny because they, uh, in the discussion board, they were talking about, well, why wouldn't you uh, use, you know, feet? like actuators instead of tread and the guys yeah. were saying well we would do that except it would keep falling down and killing people yeah because what was that robot contest that they just had recently yeah, where the robots robot. were trying to open doors and the stuff robotic like that challenge can you imagine one of those falling over on you <laughs> <laughs> yeah uh, what i would like to see because they they did say so a, a year from now they're going to meet on a field of battle and they're going to have it out the Japanese team wants melee combat. The American team wants projectile combat. I think it's probably going to be some combination of the two. <laughs> so a gun sword. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Wait, who uses a gun sword? Uh, uh, Wolfwood. Oh. No, uh, uh, Wolfwood from Trigun. He has the cross. He has the cross. Yeah. Dargo from Farscape has a gun sword. <laughs> we are nerding We're out today. nerding out, yeah. That, oh, <laughs> robot jocks. What is this? This is such a bad movie. <laughs> this is so <laughs> Is this what they got all their inspiration from? <laughs> no, this is so <laughs> bad. This, no, Alex, stop it. Stop. I'm Wait, going, I've I'm, never seen this. I'm losing I don't know all this my is. geek cred with this movie. This is really <laughs> bad, seriously. You, you can, I, I've got a copy. Watch it. It's so bad. It uh, is horrific. I mean, I was so excited as a kid. Yeah. And then it I came out. I saw the trailers out. and they came out. I'm like, this is horrible. Is this like your your uh, childhood Pacific Rim? Uh, really? Yes. Yeah. Yes. And this is this is actually the movie that killed all giant robot movies until Pacific Rim. <laughs> 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 and Transformers. After this one, we're like, no more. <laughs> it was so bad. The robots were clumsy. The CG was horrible. And the, the voice act, the, it was just terrible. It kind of looks like terrible, Thunderbirds. Terrible, terrible. You know, like the, it should be marionette puppets with this or something. Oh, yeah, the, well, the plot of this Aww. movie is, so instead of fighting, the countries send out their, like, robot representatives. Oh, yeah. Like, we're going to battle yeah. over Alaska today. OK, you lose. <laughs> I get Alaska. <laughs> Giant robot. Oh yeah, right. that looks good. Yeah, that's yeah. That's exa that's exactly what Pacific Rim copied. We should build this. <laughs> Look, wait, oh. flying fist! Oh Look no, out. wait, Run. don't stop that thing! Ooh. Right to the kidneys. <laughs> and the this is what would happen if the robots had uh, feet instead of tracks. Ah uh, yeah. yeah, so that's a good of... reason to have tracks. Yeah. Right there. There you go. There you go, folks. <laughs> so if you wanna get your robo on.
Uh, wait about a year. We should see an epic clash between... Megabots. Bots. <laughs> yeah, I'm looking forward to that. It's the it's battle bots to the next level. Uh, also, I mean, you're talking about tonnage instead of poundage, so <laughs> yeah, it's gonna be somebody's gonna get poundage. I just at at those weights, you can't really have pilots in the bots. Cause no, that would be terrifying. Would <laughs> yeah. Right? Hmm. Wait, drone bots. Drone bot. <laughs> yeah, look at that poor guy. He's getting messed up in there. Actually, these bots do fly. See, oh, look, look, what? Laser. Laser? Laser. Oh. Oh, no, what you gonna do now, son? Kneecapped. <laughs> yeah, if, right. if it let's, turns out to be like that, I will be so happy. Let's get away from the bots because we got some <laughs> serious science to do and, okay, and we're running a little bit. Okay, fine. All right. Now, uh, I, I did get a little something something for Before You Buy not yeah. too long ago. It was this. It was the uh, phone, phone soap. Phone soap? No, phone soap. Phone like, soap. Phone Phone soap. Okay, soap doesn't seem to be a good idea for your phone. Uh, probably not, but this is a special soap. It's yeah. UV soap. Oh. So, so the idea is... It's they, not soap at all, then. It's not soap. <laughs> they just, you know... Just, yeah, yeah. It's a cool name. It wasn't copyrighted yet. Okay. Uh, so what they wanted is they gave us this little... Let's, I think you can get this on the side view. <laughs> they gave us this little device that allows you to put a phone in here, and uh, then you've got um, UV, UV light lamps that are supposed to kill most of the bacteria. Now, in practice, in theory, actually, this, mm -hmm. this should work. UV does kill bacteria. Don't they use that for like toothbrushes and stuff? Toothbrushes, too? water purification plants, I mean, you name it. It, it's, it is a very good way to kill bacteria without having to dump chemicals in or you know, do anything strange or, or very costly and time consuming. Mm -hmm. But um, of course, anytime I get something like this that, that makes claims like, you'll never get sick again. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I mean, I'm sure my phone is disgusting, but I wasn't aware that it was making me sick that often either. Right, right. And so you kind of chuckle and you go, oh, this is horrible. And Carson gave this to me. He goes, well, you're going to test this. And I'm like, well, how okay. am I going to test this? And then I realized this is a great opportunity to do a little science fair stuff. Oh, are you going to swab it and We're see gonna what grows from it and test. stuff? Yeah. We're doing a bacterial test, uh, which you've seen these before. I mean, if you've ever watched something like the Mythbusters or, or just the Discovery Channel, yeah. you'll know that the best way to test for the presence of bacteria is to swab it and then put it into some sort of medium that can encourage its growth. I'm a little scared about this. I probably don't want to know how <laughs> gross probably phones don't, are. Yeah. But we're going to do it anyways. Okay. And this is a great experiment. If, if you're like a father-son, mother-daughter team, this is something that they can take to school. They can do it. It's actually very, very easy. Uh, I'm going to show you a complicated set of steps today that you don't actually have to do, mm -hmm. but I think it's fun to do. All right, so here's what we're going to do. The first thing we need to do is we need to create something for the bacteria to grow on. We okay. have to be able to see it. That's why we have to encourage the growth because bacteria are really small, right? <laughs> Wait, I can't see them? Yeah, I know, it's just, you can't, but... But it, they multiply quickly. They multiply incredibly quickly, especially if you give them the right temperature yeah. and the right kind of food, the right medium in which, they, in which they can grow. I learned that from the Martian. Right, exactly. Mm -hmm. So what we can do mm -hmm. is we can encourage the growth and then by looking at the colony, at the shape, the size, the color, how it's growing, the form that it's growing. You can figure out what kind of bacteria it is? You can figure out what kind of bacteria it is. Because not all bacteria is harmful. Most bacteria is actually good. Right. I mean, we need them. Yeah. But we're, I mean, we're figuring that out now. Some of them on the phone probably aren't that great. So we're going to need a few things. Uh, first of all, uh, we do need a hot plate because we're going to have to heat up the, the broth. Mm -hmm. We're creating an, an agar broth. That's going to be, it's going to gel and it's mm. going to become the growth medium. I know. This sounds delicious mm. <laughs> if you're a bacteria. Nom, 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 nom. Yeah. Uh, we're also going to need these. Now, these are, these are uh, petri, petri dishes, dishes right? Yeah. yeah, you've seen these before. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, one of the things to remember about this is don't open the bag unless you have to. This is actually a sterile bag. Ah, uh, okay. okay. It, this is the key to doing an experiment like this. You want to keep everything as sterile as long as you don't possibly can. Don't want to contaminate your uh, specimen. Right, because the only thing we want growing in these things is the bacteria that we swab on it. If, yeah. if, if you contaminate it, it invalidates the entire experiment. So if you had them laid out and I just happened to go, well, that's you! That, Oops, we're done, we're done. Sorry, yeah. Padre. Just, uh, bye, oh thanks, that was yeah. fun. Uh, <laughs> so you will need this, now don't open it unless you're ready to open it. And uh, I'm gonna say this several times, but once we do have these open, yeah. never open the Pichu dish unless you are actively pouring something into it or swabbing. All the other times it should be closed. So consider okay. this like a clean room, a microchip clean room. Right. So. If you open the bag, do you have to use all the Petri dishes or no. they go bad? Uh, no. And actually, this is what we used to do in the lab. You always use a pair of scissors because if you, if you do this like, 
I'm hooked. You're gonna tear all the way down. What you can do is take out the the, the dishes you need and then just like fold up the bag and clip it shut. Okay. Um, but you don't want it to stay like that for an extended period of time. Like right. if I had this, uh, we actually do have a lab at St. Ignatius uh, in San Francisco. Uh, we use up the bag within like three days. So if, it, if you leave it lo open longer than three days, you just toss it out, you assume it's, it's contaminated. Okay. All right. So we're also going to need distilled water. Uh, distilled water is yeah. a special kind of water. This has been steam distilled. So right. what they've done is they heat it up until you, it starts to evaporate, right. right? It's boiling. And then they condense the steam back into water and that should give you really That takes out all the minerals and things like that? Minerals, there should be no organisms in there. It should be nice, pure This is water. what you would put in your radiator, right? Correct. In or instead of like tap water. Instead of tap water. <laughs> or like if you have a, um, what are the humidifier, an ultrasonic humidifier. Mm -hmm. If you've ever used one of those, you get that layer of mineral oh, yeah, crust. Yeah, crust, yeah. You would use this instead. Okay. That's, that's what you would want. So, um, a couple other things you're gonna want. You're gonna need uh, some alcohol. I've got used some that before. 91% pure alcohol. You're also gonna need, these are sterile swabs. So these are cotton swabs, but just like the Petri dishes, they've been sealed. Mm -hmm. You do not open it until you are ready to swab. <laughs> if you open this and just leave it on the table, yeah. it's contaminated. And don't reuse it either, <laughs> yeah. It's a one. I, that should go case, without right? saying. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah, don't okay. don't reuse these. Uh, and then one of the biggest things is this. So this is the nutrient agar. Ooh. This is eight grams. This will make about 350 milliliters of solution. Uh, this is, I believe, seaweed based. But there's also soy based. There's some that are made with lamb blood. Oh, this is the food. This is the food. So okay. this is the stuff that we're going to mix into the boiling distilled water and we're going to be able to make ourselves a solution. So cool. in this particular case, um, I'm going to use, where did I use it? I, I already purified, oh, there it goes. I purified this. So uh, all, all I did was I used a little bit of alcohol mm -hmm. and I, I swished around all the surfaces. Okay. Okay, and you don't clean it out. You don't put a towel in there or anything because the alcohol will naturally will evaporate, evaporate yeah. and then you don't have to worry about it. So I'm going to go ahead and put myself uh, a little, like, so let's see, I only want to use about half of this. So I'm going to use about... Oh, I don't know, 175 milliliters of distilled water. It's like a recipe, right? <laughs> it sounds delicious. <laughs> this is good stuff. <laughs> and we're going to turn this on high. Now, it's going to okay. take a while for that to boil. Uh, so in the meantime, I'm going to go ahead and mix in some ag uh, agar here. Uh, okay. so there is, they have like tubs of pre-prepared agar that you like heat up in the microwave and then you pour out. You sprinkle it on your dinner? Uh, actually, people do. Oh, okay. If they, want, if they want a lot of protein. So don't be making fun of the Are? people who decide to eat <laughs> this stuff. They're aggering, yeah. They're <laughs> <laughs> feeling very aggery. <laughs> Dude, you're so aggro. <laughs> okay. And again, I'm using scissors, and these, actually, I sterilized these before. I'm using scissors and not just tearing the bag open because I don't want to make a mess. Ooh, it's kind of... So uh, normally I would pre-measure this, but in this case, I'm just going to eyeball this and use about half... Half of, of the bag? Of the agar, right. <laughs> <Woo>. <laughs> for, <laughs> for the magic of TV. This is good yeah. stuff. You can go to the mm. side view here. There we go. Oh, Look that's like that. You know what it reminds me of, actually? This is like the flavor packet in... <laughs> a tang or something like <laughs> no, that? No, like a cup of noodles. <laughs> <laughs> a cup of... <laughs> it, mm, doesn't that make you feel good? Yeah. All right, so I also have this. This is a, a glass stirring rod. Uh, one of the easiest ways, I did disinfect this with alcohol beforehand, but I've been touching it. Oh, by the way, I normally use gloves, but because I know that everything here is contaminated, I'm not even bothering. Uh, you can use a little <laughs> bit of flame, and uh -huh. all you're doing is you're just basically brazing the surface to make sure that you're, you don't have any bacteria. You're, you're burning them right yeah. now. Help me! What are you doing? What have There's we been done a disturbance in the force. It's like a thousand bacteria all screamed out at once. <laughs> exactly. So what I'm going to use, I'm going to use this to go ahead and stir this up. Now, in my lab in, uh, in San Francisco, I actually have a magnetic stirring device. So built into the plate is a little electromagnet that spins. Oh, okay. And you can put a little capsule inside. And that'll mix everything up. And okay. Right. It'll just spin. It'll just mix it up as it boils. But you're going full manual today. We're going full manual because... because uh, we want this to be an experiment that people can do at home. Yeah. Now, you want to be able to do this with your kid. There's nothing here that's going to be dangerous or cost a whole heck of a lot of money because th that would just make it no fun. Other than all. this plate being hot, I guess. Don't. But you could do that on your oven? Could you, you use could. your oven for you that? You could. You yeah. could. Now, uh, Alex, let's go ahead and take them through some of the Amazon links. Uh, now, for this particular experiment, I got sterile Petri dishes, and they were about $10.95 each. I got the Nutrient Agar. 
Uh, now, I could get a lot of it. This is enough for experiments for the rest of my life, and it would be about $10, $9.50. Or you can get tiny little packets for like a buck. You also need sterile cotton-tipped applicators, uh, just like this. this. Remember, we were talking about this. You want to keep these wrapped yeah. up until you use keep them. Keep them sealed. Mm -hmm. A hot plate. Now, this is a cheap hot plate. This is a $15 hot plate. Uh, you, if you want, you could get the one that has the built-in stir. I wouldn't recommend it unless you're actually doing a lot of chemistry and biology experiments. Hmm. Uh, Pyrex. This is important. You want Pyrex or the equivalent, the non-branded equivalent. That's because we're going to be heating these things up. A lot. You don't want them shattering. Yeah, that would be bad. Yeah. Uh, these, these are rated to be heated up. Uh, you can get yourself a nice set. Where's that coming from? <laughs> it's coming from Alex. Alex. <laughs> is this, a, this is our building a, a science project music. <laughs> right. And then you, you're going to need alcohol. Uh, so altogether, this was like 6027. Or you could just uh, get a bacterial growth kit. Is 70% uh, enough for... Yeah. Will that evaporate? Okay. And yeah, everything? Yeah. Actually, okay. it's it's a little. I, I only have this because I was doing flame experiments. Oh, okay. 91 burns a lot better. Because is it is it hard to get your hands on 91? I can't. No. Or in, maybe it's well, anything above the CES. that. I think I was trying for myself. I was trying to find a higher. Oh, like 99 percent. So then I could uh, put my phone in it. That's you know. actually a different know-how. Yeah, we'll do that another. We time. can do that. We okay. can do that in the house. Back so, to the experiment. Back to the experiment. So this is going to go ahead and and pour. Let's talk a little bit about what we're gonna. Uh, uh, do. Oh, and mm -hmm. by the way, you also are probably going to want some sort of thermometer. Uh, regular dipping thermometer works, but I like... Heat gun? Heat gun. It looks cool, too. Yeah, little, but it's also contactless. Remember, we want <laughs> no contamination. Wait a minute. You're telling me this is hot? Wow. All right. <laughs> <laughs> now, again, so that agar is going to go ahead and it's going to boil. We're going to boil it for a minute. We're going to just keep it on heat, on temperature because we want to go ahead and make sure that it's it's can nice I and stir sterile. It, you can stir it. Yeah, just don't can, stick my finger. Just don't in stick it, your right? finger in there. Mm -hmm. um, and um, one of the other things about the agar is it needs to be able to grow multiple types of bacteria. Hmm. Uh, if that's what you're looking for, if you're looking to do a swab test, there's also agar out there that will only allow for the growth of certain types of bacteria. So if, so you, if you're looking for something specific. If you're trying to culture something specific, yeah, mm -hmm. exactly. That's You would use one of those so that other bacteria might be impeded and it helps you with your experiment. Okay. Uh, now, okay. this is going to solidify. After we get it boiling, it's going to solidify when it hits about 30 degrees. So when it gets around room temperature, it's going to start setting because it right. is like gelatin. So that's also why we want this because... We want to keep it in there until it's cool enough to pour into the petri dishes, but we need to pour it before it gets so cold that, that it's jello. It just turns into jello. Okay. Right, right. So it, are we supposed to see bubbles? It's supposed to be. It's boiling? gonna get there. Or it's it because we've added the agar. It's actually it's got a higher a boiling boiling temperature. It's gonna take some time. I, I didn't get a laser uh, uh, hot plate, so don't worry about that. Mm -hmm. So, so uh, now let, let's let that keep going. Let's okay. talk a little bit about uh, what we're hoping to see here. Okay. Uh, when we start doing the experiment, which we're gonna, we actually have to design the experiment. We're gonna do that in the next episode. You don't just wanna willy nilly start doing stuff. Right. You wanna plan your steps. Yeah, because this this experiment's gonna take a couple of days. So okay. you don't wanna get to the next step and realize you missed something and you now have to restart. Uh, yeah. Because essentially you have to throw everything away. If you contaminated something. Right. Uh, and that's why we're gonna be doing. We're gonna talk about something in the next episode about making a sample. A control sample. Mm -hmm. So we are going to pour a petri dish with this with this agar, with nothing but the agar, just to see what happens. Right. That, that's our base. That's or... our base. We're going to seal it. If bacteria starts growing in that, it means uh, we, we messed something up. up. Yeah. I sneezed into this while it was boiling. Exactly. Yeah. And a control is always ex very very important in an experiment. You can't have an experiment without a control because you need to know sort of before and after. Yeah. If you don't have the before, then you have no idea if the after is actually showing you any useful information. Right, right. Okay, right, right. cool. So that's, that's what we're going to be doing. Uh, now, one of the other things that we, uh, we want to remember is when we start doing experiments in which we're dealing with bacteria, mm -hmm. gloves, <laughs> yeah, masks. Okay. Uh, we're not dealing with dangerous bacteria, we don't think, but right. we kind of have to assume that we are. But we also don't want to contaminate things, too, right, so isn't right. that a good idea? That's always a good idea. Uh, we're not doing that right now. We're doing the next episode because we're not going to be swabbing anything in this episode. We're not looking at anything in this episode. We're just setting up the experiment. 
Man, can we, I want to, now that we've started it, I don't want to stop. Well, it, it's going to take a while because remember what we have to do, uh, and we'll talk, again, we're going to talk about this in the next episode. Uh -huh. When If we want to test whether or not this phone soap yeah. is going to be able to get rid of the bacteria on this phone, this is probably what we're going to do. Swab it first. Swab it. And then put it in, right. and then swab it again. Exactly. And we'll have two sets. Two sets, and it's even better if you if you do it with multiple devices. Like we don't want to have the outlier being okay. Well, your phone was just ridiculously filthy. <laughs> we should do like a contest, like get everybody's phones in the That's studio the and see whose is the grossest. Actually, I, if I had to put my money on something, keyboards. keyboards oh, are keyboards are filthy. Yeah. yeah. Actually, we probably will. We'll probably just do a couple of swabs for fun because we're gonna have. Like ten packs. Uh, we should, yeah, we should sneak swab some people's keyboards, <laughs> and, like, and then we'll label them later. How, and about, I, how about we swab the TriCaster or, board? Oh, oh, the TriCast. oh God! That how many, how many the people grossest. are touching this every day? Hey, Alex, how comfortable are you hands? with that T-bar? Uh, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Now Alex isn't gonna change any of the cameras. So yeah, we just have to like sneak around. Oh, and by the way, we're not gonna do the toilet seat because if you've ever watched an experiment like this, yeah, that's always clean. Right. There's nothing I think, on a toilet seat. Don't they usually say the uh, dirtiest place is your kitchen sink Kitchen or sink. Uh, handles in the handles, bathroom yeah. of, of the taps. <laughs> but the toilet itself the door, is actually not to that bad. The toilet's actually yeah. really, really good. <laughs> you could actually, I, you yeah. know, I wouldn't. No. But you could eat off a toilet seat before you eat off a kitchen counter. A kitchen counter is disgusting. Yeah. Uh, and your keyboard is especially if you eat at your keyboard <laughs> which I know. we have a tendency to we, do that we have a tendency to do all right so uh that so we're starting to get some bubbles so this is starting to this is starting to take shape here uh now we're not going to yeah. be able to pour this because it's going to take some time for it to cool down but eventually what we want is we're going to go ahead and open this up mm -hmm. like so with the scissors with the skizzers because we want we don't want to destroy the packaging we're not complete cave people well, mostly. <laughs> Although these okay. scissors don't I, <laughs> seem to be working very well. These were Jeff Needle scissors. So. When you uh, disinfected them, did you sharpen them? Or? <laughs> <laughs> I think I think I. Okay, so first of all, when I, again, if I'm if I'm dealing with petri dishes, normally I'd want to be wearing gloves right now. It stays closed. Keep it closed. Don't open it up. If I'm opening this thing up, it means that I'm 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 exposing it to contamination. Right. Right. The other thing that I'm going to want to do is once I pour this, it's going to take. Okay. So now we're starting to boil. So yeah. go ahead and measure out a minute from now. Okay. Uh, that's when we should. We've you know, got tw it's twenty six thirty. Yeah. So the like twenty seven thirty or so is okay. when we should start worrying about this. I'm probably going to have to take the heat down because it's going to boil over. <laughs> He's gone Good job, mad. Brian. Good job, Brian. <laughs> Good thing nothing ever goes wrong on this set. <laughs> I know. You lose. You lose. Let that continue to boil. So what just happened? Well, it got... It, it just got too hot. And it then, boiled. Okay. Right. Which is why I normally like that I have a one uh, 1,000 milliliter flask. Yeah. But I didn't use it because it didn't look good on camera. It's okay, Padre. Don't worry. I'm going to stir it. Yeah. We and, got and, this. And actually, one of the nice things about this kind of a heat... <laughs> well, okay, see, now you're doing that. Did I make it worse? You made it so worse. Uh, Jammer B... Uh, can we get a towel? <laughs> we need a towel. <laughs> Everybody needs a towel. Uh, oh, I'm gonna catch it. Don't worry. Hey, hey, you know what? That is that is delicious, nutritious, nutrient agar. So you I just don't, you don't enjoy know. yourself a hot cup of that. <laughs> yeah. All right. So uh, when we pour this, we want to pour these uh, about not halfway, but about quarter, a quarter, a quarter full, and uh, that's gonna give us the level that we want to, uh, want it to set at. Uh, and, but then we're gonna have to let them cool because it's gonna turn into like a gelatin. Okay. Okay. Uh, and one other part is when you store these, because you are gonna store these, we're not gonna use these until next week. Uh -huh. What you actually wanna do is in the in the fridge, when, yeah. you, when you stack these up, turn it upside down. We're putting them in the fridge? Uh, as long as Debbie doesn't throw them out. <laughs> well, so does that inhibit any bacterial growth or anything if you put it in a cold Well, we want to because we're not gonna swab it. Oh, okay. So th yeah, this is cold storage. Okay. And the reason why we put it upside down is because we don't want any condensation on the the uh, roof, on the petri dish itself, uh. to to contaminate the uh, the sample. Because if you get water into the agar, what will happen is it, it becomes a way for bacteria to move around in the media. Uh, I see. It's like uh, a pathway for it. Right. Huh? Right. Okay. Which which we'll explain in the next episode why you don't want that. Sure. So. This is a long-winded way to do this kind of an experiment. There is actually another way to do it without having to do any of this stuff. Uh, and how's that? 
Do you buy petri dishes with this stuff already in it? Yep. <laughs> you can totally do this. This, this is, uh, these are pre-prepared agar dishes. Yeah. They are, uh, this is how this is eventually going to look after we pour everything. Uh, but the advantage to this, of course, is we don't have to worry about a hot plate. We don't have to worry about sport. <laughs> boiling we don't have to worry it about over. boiling it over. Yeah. Um, and uh, yeah. and nothing, nothing can go wrong. Yep. And the other nice thing about this is you've already got your control because if they arrive and there's no bacteria, then you're nothing, good. Yeah, nothing's going to grow in this. Yeah. Uh, you still, okay. you'll still do, we'll still do a control because did you that's get, what you should do. Did you get those off Amazon also? Yeah, everything here is off Amazon. Are they pretty cheap? Super with, cheap. With was, the agar in it? A stack of 10 was like 16 bucks. Yeah, so that's, I, that mean, that's Just, actually the much cheaper way to do this kind of an experiment. But the nice thing about doing it this way is you know where the, it's coming from? Well, it's, you can play. The, 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 yeah, you can play yeah. and you can have cleanup. And you can have cleanup. That's, that's what we do here on Know How. <laughs> Yeah, <laughs> wonderful. So in the next episode, what we're actually going to do is we're going to be, I'm going to make these plates after mm -hmm. the episode, and we're going to do the swabbing. So I'm going to show you the proper technique for swabbing. I'm going to show you the proper way to design your experiment. Okay. And hopefully we're going to find some disgusting, disgusting stuff. <laughs> yeah, fingers crossed we find some really gross bacteria. And keyboards. And keyboards. And what else should we swab? You know what? Tricaster, should... keyboards, Tricaster keyboards, other people's phones. Kitchen surface. Yeah, probably like handles of certain like office doors. I'd and stuff. say the whole kitchen table thing. The kitchen there. table. Kitchen would be table. Good. Burke's oh. workspace. Leo's desk, maybe, Leo's or desk. Leo's mic. <gasps> the microphones. Yeah, Swab the, the mics. mics. The microphone. That's what we got. Okay. All right. Now, when we come back, we've got to finish up Project Know How 250. Remember, we've been building a, a far more powerful quadcopter. <sighs> yes, you yeah. want the power. You're gonna want the power. But before we do that, let's go ahead and thank the first sponsor of this episode of Know How. Now, let me ask you, Brian, mm -hmm. when uh, when you're downstairs playing with your with your toys, yeah. uh, you need tools, yeah? <laughs> I, I usually need tools because I'm breaking things. You, or I need to take things. things apart. Exactly. Yeah, recently my Moto X died. I had to pry off the back of it, and it has really tiny little screws, and I found everything I needed. <laughs> in this kit that I just dropped Just stuff. upside down. Well, yeah, you know what? Upside down. Rather than showing the kit that I Brian can't... just dropped on the floor. Uh, Typically, I would Alex, show it off right Alex, push that here. magic button that shows people exactly what an iFixit kit looks like. <laughs> uh, we trust iFixit because we go to them for all of our tool needs. We're not talking just about screwdrivers. We're yeah. talking about spudgers. We're talking about all the little appliances that you need to be able to open up the devices that you use most often. Now, what I really love about iFixit is that it's not just a tool company. They're also a company that gives you the actual guides, the instructions for opening up everything from a McDonald's toy to a laptop. If you want to fix your Xbox, if you want to fix a doorknob, if you need something to help you fix a home appliance, iFixit can help. Now, they've also got foolproof instructions for things like iPhone screens or swapping batteries on a Galaxy or fixing the red ring of death on an Xbox. They've also got parts that you can order that are guaranteed. So if you ever have been uh, wandering around the Internet looking for something to fix one of your favorite toys but you're not sure if you should trust them, well, don't do that. Just go to iFixit and be done with it. Now, this toolkit is the gold standard. It's 70 tools to assist you with any mod, malfunction, or misfortune that comes your way. It's got a 54-bit driver kit that includes Phillips bits, Pentalo bits, Torx and Torx security bits, tri-wing bits, triangle bits. It's also got a swivel top precision driver and a flex extension to get into those hard-to-read places, including these spudgers, nylon spudgers and metal spudgers, so you can open up computer cases the right way without scratching them up. Now, if you've ever wondered how you are going to treat the geek in your home, the next birthday, the next occasion, Christmas, whatever it's going to be, I suggest an iFixit toolkit because it's something that he or she will use for the rest of their life. Best of all, there are thousands of iFixit tool guides and, and repair guides to help you put those tools to use. Now, with iFixit, you can fix it yourself, and iFixit will definitely help. Visit iFixit.com twit for more than 10,000 free step-by-step -step guides iFixit also sells every part and tool that you'll need. Enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout, and you'll save $10 off any purchase of $50 or more. That's iFixit.com slash twit. iFixit.com slash twit. And enter the code KNOWHOW at checkout to save $10 off your purchase of $50 or more. And we thank iFixit for their support of KNOWHOW. Hey, Brian. Mm hmm? You like to fly? I love to fly. You like to fly fast? Yes, very fast. Well, Alex... Push that magic button.
in the last episode of Project Know How 250, we configured your flight controller, tested your motors, cleaned up the wiring, and buttoned up the chassis. This time, we're going to take to the skies. The first step is to attach your battery and balance the center of gravity. You want your KH250 to balance at the center of the frame. You should be fine left to right, but the placement of the battery pack will slide your COG forward and back. This is an important step because while your craft will fly with a center of gravity that is slightly off, you'll lose performance in one direction because the motors on one side will have to use more of their throttle range just to keep level. Once you're satisfied with your center of gravity, strap up your battery and secure it. Switch on your transmitter, set the KH250 on a level surface, then connect power. Step back about 7 feet, making sure to stay to the rear of the craft, then set your mode to full manual or acro mode and arm the flight controller. Give it about 10% throttle, just enough to get the prop spinning, but not enough to lift off. If the KH250 starts to leave the ground, reduce throttle. Hold at this throttle and look for any excessive vibrations or wobble that could indicate a loose motor or prop. Now move the right stick forward until the KH250 starts to tilt forward. Move the stick back and it should rock back on the rear landing gear. Move to the left and right, checking to see if the quad leans in that direction. Lastly, move the left stick right and left to see if the craft will start to rotate in that direction. If any of these inputs fail to cause the expected action, then you need to check your transmitter for reverse channels and your wiring for incorrect connections. Go through the instructions of the previous episode to make sure that everything is configured properly. When you're satisfied that the control inputs are properly configured, throttle down and disarm the flight controller. Disconnect power and do a close inspection of the KH250, paying special attention to the motor mounting, the prop spinners, the extension frame standoffs, and the battery. If anything has shifted or come loose, you'll need to tighten and secure. If everything stayed in its proper place, then we can start flying. Put the KH250 on a level surface, power it up, then move 7 feet away, making sure to stay behind the craft. Switch to angle or full self-leveling mode, then arm the flight controller. Slowly bring up the throttle, allowing the KH250 to rise off the ground. If it starts to wobble, oscillate, or careen out of control, bring down your throttle and put it back on the ground. Don't risk any people or property. You can always fix your quad. If it flies true, let the quad rise until it's about four to five feet off the ground. You'll have to work the right stick to hold position as wind will probably push your quad off station. Make sure to use small, constant inputs. You don't want to send your KH250 into overcorrection after overcorrection. Something that you'll notice is that just a few inches off the ground, there seems to be a bounce when you bring your craft down. That's the ground effect. The prop wash creates a cushion of turbulence near the ground that can give your craft a little lift. The bigger the props, the bigger the cushion, but also the more turbulent the air. Rise above it and you'll get a much smoother ride. There is one last bit of setup that we should do, the setting of the throttle curve. If you stay with the default settings on your transmitter, your KH250 will have a tendency to need constant throttle corrections to maintain a hover. You can fix that by flattening the throttle response at the point that your KH250 hovers. First. Find the point on your throttle where the KH250 hovers. Now go into the throttle curve settings on your transmitter and make that the midpoint of your throttle range and flatten the curve around that point. What you're doing is increasing sensitivity before and after the hover point while also making the hover sweet spot easier for you to hit on the throttle. Hover, a lot. You can vary your altitude but always keep it low enough so that chopping the throttle won't cause extensive damage. If you watched our episode on Vortex Ring State, you know that your quad will be unstable if you try to bring it straight down. That's because it has to fly through the turbulence that it's creating. If you want a smoother flight, always descend while moving parallel to the ground. If you're just starting, you should only be practicing three inputs, elevator, aileron, and throttle. The yaw or rudder should be left alone. Keep the quad's rear pointed towards you and don't worry about rotating the craft just yet. Alternate hover practice with an occasional landing. Make sure to account for the ground effect. Once you're comfortable with takeoff, landing, and hovering, it's time to walk the quad. Take off and place your quad a safe distance in front of you. Start walking and push your quad forward, trying to get a feel for how she responds to inputs. You need to train your brain how to adjust the flight of your quad to keep it in control. Once walking the quad becomes second nature, it's time to move on to my favorite exercise, the circle of death. You've been using throttle, elevator, and aileron, but now we're going to throw yaw into the mix. Take off and push your quad about 10 feet from you. Then, without moving yourself, slowly turn your body while keeping the quad in front of you with its rear facing your body. 
In order to do this, you're going to have to use all four controls. On the right stick, you'll have to move left or right to keep the quad in front of you, and forward or back to keep it a safe distance from your body. On the left stick, you'll need to use the yaw to slowly rotate the craft in order to keep its rear pointed at you, and the throttle to hold altitude. Slowly add more and more complexity to your exercise. Practice punching out or rapid acceleration to get a feel for how quickly you can accelerate, rise, or arrest a fall. Those are important pieces of information that will tell you how far you can push your quad before she breaks. You'll probably want to stay in angle mode and not aqua or horizon just so that you don't accidentally start flipping your quad. You're airborne. Now enjoy. Now that noise that you're hearing, mm -hmm. that's actually the props way over revving what they can handle. It sounds so cool though. It, does sound it sounds cool, angry. But we're wasting a lot of energy, but that's, that's by, uh, by design. So okay. I've, I've asked in the kit that you use these uh, five by three props that we were using in the Hobby King uh, build, right? Right. Which are nice because they're nice trading props. They're flexible. They'll, they'll break before anything else breaks. Right. Uh, Eventually, once you start feeling comfortable with the Know How 250, you're, you're going to want to go to carbon fiber. You're probably going to want to go to carbon fiber. <laughs> and really hurt yourself. Yeah, and then you will be able to use the entire range of power that the motors can deliver. And I, I got to tell you, those punch outs that I was doing in like the fast, yeah. that was maybe 50% throttle. Well, you can only do it for so, so long before the drone is just out of sight. Exactly. It's, yeah. it's hard doing it with the camera because it would only be in the camera's view for just a, like half a second. Right. Uh, at full throttle, this goes beyond line of sight in like a second and a half, two seconds. Yeah. So that's where uh, you're going to throw FPV on FPV, there, right? Which is why we built it this way. So we want the chassis, the extension chassis here, so we can put all the FPV gear, the camera, maybe some GPS stuff if we want to do some more advanced features. Uh, there have been some people in the chat room who are a little concerned that this is heavy because uh, like when we built the Hobby King 250, it was mm -hmm. about 400 grams or so. Yeah. And if you look here, I'm not, can you see this on the side camera? Oh, maybe over the overhead. Yeah, on the overhead. So without a battery, this is running you about 500 grams. The battery is going to add about 200 grams or 250 grams, depending on if you're going 3S, 4S, what size. Mm -hmm. So the flight weight is going to be about 700 grams plus. Is that heavy? It's a little bit heavy. And actually, there are a lot of ways you can make it lighter. Um, you could drop the landing gear. You could actually go with smaller ESCs. We, but remember, we didn't, we didn't design this to be a racing quad. We designed this to be a much faster quad than what we had uh, in our previous 250, mm -hmm. but it's also modular. These ESCs can be taken off and used in other projects, same things with the motors. But if we really wanted to drop weight, you would go with like a 20 amp, what's called a hug ESC, which mm -hmm. would probably get you about 150 grams of, of weight saving. You would probably go with a different kind of extension chassis, one that weighs 50 grams less, uh, you could do things like changing props, and you could even uh, change the motors to ones that are a bit more, they're not as powerful, but they're also lighter. Mm -hmm. And I could shed easily 300 grams off this craft. Right. But the nice thing about this is it's sturdy. You can, you're going to be able to crash this thing over and over again at high speeds, and it should come through pretty well. See, that's what I'm concerned about because I know I'm just getting started with the FPV stuff and it's a little um, disorienting when you have the goggles on and you can't see, like yeah. it cuts out for a second or something like that. I'm still getting used to that. So I'm going to be crashing a lot probably <laughs> before I get good at it. Yeah. So I, I think this is where I want to go with my quad next. Uh, we're going to be giving this project a couple of weeks off. Uh, so mm -hmm. we, we don't want to uh, continue this build. We want people to actually use what we've given them build yourself a high performance 250 class quad, mm -hmm. practice. You're gonna have to practice a lot, especially since if you switch into horizon mode, which is something that this flip controller will do, it does this awesome thing. And we're, I'm gonna actually teach you how to do, to do this in a future segment. If you go hard over, yeah. it will actually allow you to flip the quad and then self-level when it makes it back around. Ooh, that makes me so nervous. <laughs> it, it, it's nerve wracking, yeah. but once you start realizing that the flight controller is helping you. You're <laughs> not your fighting friend. the flight controller. Because yeah, remember, when we were dealing with the, the KKs, the KK flight controllers, you had to turn it to full manual to be able to flip it. Right. With this, you can s keep it in self-level mode until you get to the extreme edge of the stick range, and then it goes full manual, 
And then as you come back around, you just release the sticks and it will self-level again. I like that idea. Yeah. Okay. Uh, but there's this cool move I'm trying to master. I've only broken probably <laughs> 20 props. <laughs> yeah. Uh, and this, actually I crashed this one really hard. Uh, what you do is, toward the, when you're doing a speed run, towards the end of the run, you invert it and then you pull it down. Oh, Top Gun style. Yeah, it's, it's Maverick. It's so much fun, but what I did was I inverted and then I went st straight up and then I went straight down. Ooh. So yeah, that maybe sucks. you want to model that before you try it. <laughs> have you ever done where uh, you haven't completely flipped over? And yes, I have. <laughs> By the way, if you go full, full mm. throttle when the craft is still upside down, it will go straight down very quickly into the ground. That's too bad. <laughs> <laughs> it's, it's too bad. I actually have, I have a cheat. I sh you know, I'm going to confess this. I What's have a that? cheat. Um, it's not, by the way, it's not Verizon mode. It's called Horizon mode. Uh, <laughs> my cheat... You're going 4G on this? <laughs> I'm... Uh, I'm uh, flying on a football field that we have at St. Ignatius, yeah. and it's artificial turf, and it has a cork surface. Uh -huh. So when I crash, it's not nearly as bad as crashing onto, say, asphalt. Yeah, yeah. Um, so it's so a there's a little bit of a cushion there. I have a little bit of a cushion, and it's probably kept me from snapping a frame. Well, I, you know, and I've flown mine in a field and stuff, and I think I'd rather fly uh, over turf, because when you crash, you get all, like, the you blades of grass and it's dirt horrible, in there and yeah, stuff. Yeah, yeah. yeah. But uh, God, this thing is fun. I'm, I'm gonna. I'm actually gonna build one for you because I gotta <gasps> practice on this one. But I gotta build one for you because it feels so much different than the the Hobby King 250. It's like uh, so many parts are the same. It's the same frame, mm -hmm. the same idea, the same distributor. But the flight controller and the motors just make this thing scream. And I know there's a few of you out there who have already built this, and you've commented in the uh, in the uh, Google Plus group how ridiculously powerful it is. Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah, yeah, and I, I've run into the problem where my motors are too tiny now to do FPV. Remember? Do you remember when, when I we first started with it? the the SEMA, uh, the and the SEMA had so much power, and then we're like, okay, I got yeah, this. Got used to it. Then you move to the Hobby King 250, and you're like, oh, this is way too much power. Yeah. I was like, oh, it's too twitchy. It's, it's too, too twitchy. twitchy. And now it's like, oh, it's so slow. Yeah. Start all over again. <laughs> well, I keep attaching more and more stuff to it. Yeah. Well, that's going to make it heavy. So, <laughs> so that's going to be the uh, the end of Project Know How 250 for a while. In the future, I'm going to show you how to flip it. We're actually going to be uh, putting FPV on this. So, and if we're going to race it. That, we're going to be racing it. Uh, we're also going to show you people who bought the Hobby King 250, and maybe you didn't want to buy another quad. You can actually upgrade your Hobby King 250 to something very close to this with incredible performance. We're going to show you an easy way to do that. So that's that's all coming future episodes of Know How. Cool. Yeah. Oh, uh, we are going to do just a few, just a few questions. We won't be able to get through nearly all of them because we're running late on this episode. But before we do that, hey, Brian, hmm? you want to tell the good folks about Ring? Yes, Ring? Ring? yes, yes. yes Ring? Now, I have been using this at my parents' home for, what, a month, month and a half now? And I, I, I actually bought this. This was a gift that I gave to my parents. That's how much I trust them. I mean, I, I'm not going to buy something if I just think it's an okay product. If you are ever concerned about who's coming to the door, who's who's scanning the house, who's checking to see if anybody's home, if, if you're in that kind of a neighborhood or if you've got you know vulnerable parents and you want to take care of them, Ring is a great way to give yourself a peace of mind. Now, this is what the Ring looks like. This is a complete set. It includes the Ring doorbell, the drill bit, the screws, the mounts. Yeah, yeah, uh, that thing. Even this awesome little bell. Now, this will integrate with your current house. So if you've got a doorbell at your the front uh, at the front door, it, it connects into here and it, it supplies power. But even if you don't, if you've got a house that's not wired for that, turn it over, there's a little USB port. Charging this thing full will keep it powered for an entire year. Now, what exactly does it do? Well, it's like caller ID for your house. When someone pushes the bell, or even if they come in in range of the motion detector, it will start taking video and it will send it to your phone. Now, here's the cool thing. Here's, here's my phone. This is connected to the, uh, the ring that's inside my parents' house in Henderson. Today at 9.21 a.m., it was activated. There was some motion just outside the gate, and what this will allow me to do is it will allow me to see if, well, did this person actually come up to the window? Did this person actually go to the door? Did this person ring the bell? Or was this person just, you know, staring through yeah, the Yeah, scoping courtyard? out the windows or something. I, and I love this, and if I find a, a video that's suspicious, I just click, uh, I've got a little button right here, to download it to my phone, and now I've got it always and forever in case I need it. This is the kind of convenience that Ring gives you. And it also gives you the ability to answer your phone in case someone's coming to your house when you're not there. Like, for example, the FedEx guy comes, rings mm -hmm. the doorbell, and you can say, oh, hey, 
I've got a box around back and you put it in there rather than throwing right. it over the fence. <laughs> like you did last time like because last I have time. the video yeah. of it. By now. Way, I've got that video, so right. just FYI, <laughs> cut it out. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, Ring is not just the coolest doorbell ever. It's not just peace of mind. It's also something that I personally believe people should try. Now, Ring is making it easier than ever for you to try it out because they're going to give you $25 off just for being a know-how viewer. Right now, you can get it for $174. That's $25 off the normal price. Protect your home and have a peace of mind with Ring. Go to ring.com slash knowhow. That's ring.com slash knowhow. And we thank Ring for their support of knowhow. My gonna, favorite part, you can, change, you can change the ring so my dog won't freak out every time he hears the doorbell. Uh, mine will be Doctor Who. Doctor Who? <laughs> <laughs> All right. Now uh, let's see how much time we have left. We've got like 10 minutes or so, probably not that much, but let's jump into a couple of the questions. What's the first one, Brian? So this comes from Joseph Sacco. Sacco. I'm going to say it. I, I hope it's that Sacco? pronounced. Sacco. Mm. Uh, I want to move my router to a more exposed location, like my living room, but I do not want to mess with wires that come with it. I have a Roku 3, Tableau, DVR, and a Western Digital MyBook Live that all need to be connected to it. My plan is to run one Ethernet cable between the router and the switch. That would be located nearby uh, in an in entertainment cabinet and connected with uh, connect my devices to the switch. I went to Staples and looked at the Netgear switches. They make managed switches, unmanaged switches, and smart switches. Which one do I need, and can I connect an Ethernet cable from my modem to my switch, or does that need to go directly into my router? First of all, don't get the managed. Don't get the smart switches. You don't need them, nope. not nope. for a home environment. Nope. Unless you're doing some very cool VLAN stuff, you don't need management whatsoever. Sounds like he just wants it to work. You just want it to work, which you can do. Uh, now, we've talked a little bit about this, but I, I, I like repeating it because I don't think people get it often enough. Mm -hmm. uh, there's always the thing of, you got the router, right? Right. And the router has maybe four, maybe even five ports on it. Yeah. And so people will plug in like their Xbox and their computer, and, and then they realize, oh, I'm out of ports, so then they'll get another switch, yeah. and they'll, they'll daisy chain it, and then they'll plug a bunch of stuff into that switch. Right. That absolutely works. It's horrible network design. Yeah. You, you don't want to do it that way, because what you're doing is you're creating a choke point. If any of the devices that are connected to the, to the switch need to communicate to any of the devices that are connected to Ooh. the router, they have to go through that single two gigabit link, one right. gigabit up and one gigabit back. If you get enough of those devices talking at the same time, you saturate the link and bad things happen. It's like having two freeway lanes and you like have a little rural, rural road exactly. that goes in between. Exactly. <laughs> what you, uh, the, the rule of thumb that I use is any high bandwidth devices, so if you have NASs, if you have video streaming devices, mm -hmm. if you have like a server that you keep a lot of data on that you transfer back and forth, you want to make sure that that's going to be on the main segment of your network. And most likely, that's not going to be your router. So the way I would set it up is you'd have your router here, mm -hmm. buy a big enough switch so it, ha it can support all the devices. Okay. So let's say you have uh, eight devices, right? Right. And you only have four ports on your router. So you buy... A uh, um, like a, an eight port switch, right? But like, one of those ports is going to be used up in the connection to the router, which so means seven. You're going to have seven on the switch, and you're going to have like one or two, depending on what, how many what you're going to want to plug in on the router. That's a bad that's a bad setup. What you would want is you'd want a, a switch that's big enough to handle all the devices you have, plus the uplink back to the router. So it sounds like he's going to have three devices hooked up to the mm -hmm. switch, and then he'll need one more for going to the router. So or four. At least right. a four-port switch. A four-port. And, and you know what? There, the difference between a four-port and an eight-port switch is nothing. You might yeah. as well get an eight-port switch. Uh, if, you, if you think you're going to be adding a lot of devices, then, you know, go up to a 12-port. Mm -hmm. Or you could do what I, I mean. I have, I have 12 ports and 24 ports that kind of segment off my network based on what's going to be accessing what. Okay. Uh, and and just, just remember that. Remember what we told you about that uplink. You don't want that to be the choke point. So always try to keep the devices that are going to be communicating with the other devices on the same network segment. Okay. Yeah. That's, that's, that's actually good to know. It's, it's a nice rule. Yeah. Yeah. I was just trying to think. So if you had an Xbox connected to that and you had the Roku and they're all streaming from, yeah. so that's when you start getting 
Yeah, St anytime you start streaming something, that's when you're really gonna be stressing the network. I mean, email, web access, no. Mm -hmm. But like if you have a network camera, that's probably gonna be pushing some heavy bits. Okay. If you've got an Xbox, that's going to be either serving out like an Xbox One and you're gonna be streaming games to computers in the house. You, sh you should probably take a look at how much uh, data that's going to use up. Okay. Uh, that's that's the sort of stuff that you want to take a, a, a nice close look at. All right. Well, this situation sounds like he'll be in his living room. He'll be using one device probably at a right. time, so it shouldn't be an issue. It shouldn't be. Yeah. Cool. All right. All right. Hope we next? answered that. Uh, next, we uh -huh. have a question from Jim Saba. Father Robert, <laughs> Father Robert mentioned in a recent podcast a utility to retrieve the product key from an installed copy of Windows. I did. But I don't remember. I am leery of downloading anything without a recommendation. Any recommendations for extracting the product key for running Windows on a Windows device? Thank you for asking this question. It's a great question. I get it a lot, which is... Because there's a lot of scams out there. Well, there's scams, but it's also like I, got, I get a computer and it had Windows installed on it. And it might be from Dell Eraser, but it doesn't have a key. Well, and a lot of new computers don't have disk drives. Exactly, either, so. exactly. So what you can do is we're going to give you the link. You'll be able to download this this script. It's two 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 five one. I know that's not what? very descriptive, but that's what they actually call, uh, call it. It's a VB script. If you run it, you can just download this off of Windows. So you can trust Microsoft. Okay, so Microsoft this is will give off it of you. Microsoft. This website. is Microsoft yeah, exactly. If you run it. It will give you this little program that when it pops up, it's actually going to give you the installation key. Now, folks, go ahead and copy down this installation key if you want, because this was a review unit. I'm sending it back. Have fun. <laughs> so it's their problem? It's, it's really their problem. Actually, it's really not going to help so, you. So, I mean, why does, why does Windows hide the product key to begin with like that? Is that just to prevent copying and yeah, then pirated I, I versions mean, it's, or it's something? It's one extra step for you. And also, yeah. I mean, how many times do people need to know? The product key. key? Not very often. Yeah. I mean, it seems like it's pretty simple to download that script, but it's like... Yeah, and also that lets you save it to a file. So what you can do is like when you first get your computer, mm -hmm. uh, make your backup media and make the file that has all the key information and just set that aside. Put that away for a rainy day. Okay. All right? Hmm. Yeah. Cool. What's next? One more. Uh, David Keeler. Silly question. Any reason I can't use my 5500 May 14.8 uh, volts, 47 <laughs> battery on my... That's a lot of acronyms and numbers there. Uh, on my HK450. I believe I'll have to use... Uh, <laughs> you know, seven inch, inch eight, eight inch props. Oh, eight that inch props, not 10, but can he... Can the KK handle the increased volts? My other batteries are only 11.7 volts, I believe so. I thought I'd embarrass myself now and just see what happens. Yeah, okay, so he wants to, <laughs> before he ruins before things. Before he ruins yeah. it, he wants to ask. And Good the, question. The answer is, go ahead, plug it in. It's plug okay. it in, it'll be okay? It'll be okay. Uh, if you did our build that included the BEC, that's the battery eliminator circuit inside of the electronic speed controller, that automatically regulates the power. Okay, so uh, it won't so burn anything. It out. won't burn anything. So, for example, the ones that we supplied that in our in our build out instructions were three S four S. So three cells or four cells, which are going to provide you about you know eleven point one or twenty something. Uh, something, I, something. Forget whatever that is. A lot of voltage. Mm -hmm. More. Yeah. No, not you know, 15, 15, 14 point eight volts. Wow, what the heck is wrong with me? And uh, so, no matter which one you plug in that battery eliminator circuit will cut it down to five volts and feed it to your, to your flight controller. Okay. Right. So as long as you're within the tolerances of, uh, of the voltage as stated on the package, uh, you're not going to burn out the flight controller. Uh -huh. Now, I, I will say... Yeah, you have you burned... You should. You should use eight-inch props when you use a 4S battery on your uh, your your know-how or your K, your Alien X 450. Ah, yes. And uh, that's because... We told you that. Because, <laughs> because it uses more power and you don't want to burn anything out. Yeah. I will say that when I was in Hawaii, I was using 4S batteries on 10-inch props. Um, burned out your battery. It, weren't, it worked just fine. It actually did generate excessive vibration. Uh, okay. But it was really fun. <laughs> <laughs> it was really, What's your, really uh, your fun versus durability factor? I, yeah. th actually, I have a justification for it. I wanted to see how hard I could push it before I burned out the motors. Oh, so you were testing. I was testing, so it was scientific. You were doing it for the fans. I, all, for the, I, all for the fans. Oh, yeah, clearly. Yeah. Should we do one more real quick? Uh, yeah, this is okay. a nice one. All right, this comes from Amelia Morella. 
Uh, quick tip, the small screwdrivers you get in the iFixit kits are great for tightening your prop nuts. Yes, they are. Actually, so if you go to this, what he's talking about are these spinners, these spinners uh -huh. that go on, on top of the props. Yeah. There's a little hole through the top that allow you to grab right. it and, and, and you know, spin it a bit more. Okay. And what he was saying is, yeah, these, these, uh, the, the screwdriver kit from iFixit, all you have to do is take one of these, uh, the, preferably the, one of the smaller ones, and put it on your kit like so, and then you, you hold the motor, put this in there, and you can tighten it. Uh, okay, yeah. nice. Now, you don't want to tighten it too much because you'll actually split the prop, right. but uh, this is a nice, for all those folks who are having problems with props falling off. By the way, I have never had a prop fall off. I don't know why it's happened. Like some people, it happens I've, all the time. I have. But you finger tighten. I I did. I never the first time I finger tightened. That was a bad idea because I mm. got out. I got all the way out to the field and realized I didn't have everything I needed. And I tried to do that. And the second reason why it happened is um, the one I was using came with a nut and a plate, and I put the plate underneath <sighs> the prop. And yeah, but I learned once. Did I, did, learn. I did it once, did and learn. I learned. But just tight, tighten it down, folks. Yeah, and you'll be happy. Well, that's all the time we have for this episode of Know How. Uh, yeah, I know. That was a lot of stuff. A lot of knowledge. Lot of, what are we doing next week? Next week, we, we've got more germ warfare. Are we finishing the... Yeah, we're finishing the germ stuff. Right. Oh, uh, we're, we've got one last video for Maker Faire that's going to lead into a project that's a challenge between the two of us. I think we want to create uh, a quadcopter that you can actually fly indoors that's high performance that won't hurt people or anything. <laughs> and that's a challenge, yeah. That is a challenge. That's, and we have something else. It's something else that's cool will be coming up next week. Surprise. But we know that this was a lot of information, especially if you plan to do any of the bacterial swabbing. We don't want you to have to rewind this episode over and over. Yeah. So we gave you really copious show notes. And Brian, where did they find those? Oh, in the usual place, twit.tv slash kh. And uh, not only do our show notes live there, you can find all our past episodes, subscribe, uh, and, you know, just basically fill your knowledge hole there. Knowledge hole, indeed. If you want to inflict your knowledge hole on other people, you could also go to our Google <laughs> Plus group. Sounds dangerous. It, it really does, doesn't it? Yeah. Just go to Google Plus, look for the know-how group, subscribe. Go ahead. It's almost 9,000 members strong. Getting there. And it's a great place to ask questions, and you probably get answers from get all the answers. other experts on the group. Also, if you've got any videos that you want to show us, and it doesn't have to be quadcopter videos, folks. No, no. the crash videos there. are very entertaining. They are entertaining. Well, put it in there, and maybe we'll, we'll get it on our future episode of Know How. Yep, yep. I mean, if you happen to do a project that you want to show off, post it there, too. Mm -hmm. And, uh, of course, Google Plus ain't the only place they can find us on No, no, no. If you want, uh, <laughs> want behind-the-scenes kind of uh, what, what we get into, you know, when we're when not, not doing here. this show yeah. or what we're doing to get ready for this show, you can, <laughs> you can follow us on Twitter. That's I break a lot of stuff. Yeah. And you can find me at uh, Padre SJ. And I'm at Cranky underscore Hippo. And don't forget, you can find our director... What's his name again? Uh, Hal, Hal Grumple. Hal Grumple. Director. Director? Mm -hmm. Yes, yes. Uh, right, Excuse Hal? Excuse me, Brian. That's, that's Gumple. 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 I always misspell it. Yeah. And there's yeah. no H. Ah, Al. And there's an E and an Al. X. Al, Al Grumple. -E. 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 I think it's G R U N. Well, you can find that guy, the director guy who pushes our buttons at Twitter at A N E L F. Three. Thanks to everyone who makes this show possible. Of course, to Lisa and to Leo for letting us mess up the studio every once in a while. And uh, to all the engineers here who keep us from burning the place down. Until <laughs> next time. Tossing us paper towels from offset. Yeah. <laughs> I'm Father Robert Ballas there. And I'm Brian Burnett. And now that you know how. Go break it. Or spill stuff all over the floor. Yeah.